Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala Rabbi shuhli sudri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Nastaghfirullah rabbana min kulli dhanbin wa natubu ilayk rabbana zadna ilma Allahumma yassir wa la yassir tambin bi khair ya fatah ya fatah ya fatah amin ya rabbil alameen Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Wa alaikum salam Alhamdulillah, Jazakumullah Khayyan. Welcome to uh, the tafsir session, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to put barakah and uh, good to see you. a lot of uh, uh, students from uh, Heights and Academy, inshallah. So we'll get started, inshallah. Um, we'll be doing the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatih, Surah number 48. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahmani r-Rahim. إنا فتحنا لك فتحا مبينا ليغفر لك الله ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر ويتم نعمته عليك ويهديك صراطا مستقيما الحمد لله so إن شاء الله we'll recite we'll do the tafsir of just two ayats in that one hour because there's a lot of background story. So I want you guys to put your, you know, phones away or any other distraction you have. Assume that you are actually in salah, okay? You are in worship and make sure there is no distraction, inshallah, and stay uh, connected and uh, stay with me, inshallah. Uh, today's session is the most important because there's a lot of stories that I'm going to go over, inshallah. So it's going to be the seerah of Rasulullah Sallallahu If you understand that, then the rest of the surah will fall in its place. Now, I'm just, I'm not just going to tell you that this surah came after this incident, but I actually want you guys to live that incident, right? Feel that incident so that when we actually talk about it, that when we talk about the surah, you feel the emotions that Sahabas are going through, inshallah. Okay? So, Surah Al-Fatih, first, I'll mention, inshallah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that there is a surah revealed to me that is more beloved to me than what the sun rose over, okay? Than whatever the sun rises over. Meaning that there's nothing in this dunya that is more beloved to me than this surah, Surah Al-Fatih, okay? And you will understand why after we go through a, a history, inshallah. So we began, for those of you who, who know the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and if you don't know, inshallah, that's okay. I'll try my best to go in as much detail as possible, but not too detailed at the same time. We, the story begins, Muslims leaving Mecca, okay? Muslims were tortured in Mecca. Muslims were persecuted for over 13 years. And now they had to leave Mecca, unfortunately. And they moved to Medina. In Medina, the Muslims and the Quraysh of Mecca, the disbelievers, they have a lot of, you know, uh, back and forth, right? The first encounter they had was at Badr. Right, Battle of Badr, if you remember, the Muslims came on top in the Battle of Badr, alhamdulillah, right? The next encounter Muslims have was in the Battle of Uhud's. And how many of you know what happened in Uhud's? Who won? Who won in the Battle Medina. of Uhud's? The, the Quraysh of Mecca, right? So they came on top uh, once. Just one second. So it, uh, it went on like that. Then after the Battle of Uhud, the, the Quraysh got emboldened. They said, look, we were able to defeat the Muslims. You know, why don't we just gather a big army and destroy the Muslims once for all? So they mustered an army of 10,000 people and they came to attack Medina and wipe off Islam completely from the face of this earth, right? So they made allies, they made, you know, um, they convinced their allies, the different, different tribes to gather, join hands together. Uh, they even asked the Jewish tribes to finance this campaign so that they can go and fight against the Muslims. So they came with how many people in Ahzab? How many people did they gather? 10,000. Very good, 10,000 people. And Muslims, how many were the Muslims? With the civilians all together, the Muslims are only 3,000, right? And at that point, Salman al-Farzi, Right, so a man from Persia, he gives the idea to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, this army is coming. Uh, the best way to defend is to dig a trench. So this trench would take about a year, but the Muslims, you know, everyone together, 
went on this and they were able to finish digging the trench in just six days. Okay, so what happened then? The Quraysh come and they see that, you know, there's a big, uh, you know, ditch that they could not cross over. But then what happened is they settled outside. And now the enemy came in the month of Shawwal. Okay, in the month of Shawwal, in the 10th month, you can imagine the 10th month, like October, you can imagine, right? The 10th month or the 10th month of Islamic calendar is Shawwal. So they come in Shawwal and they settle outside of Medina for about 25 days. The Muslims, Muslims are running out of supplies. Muslims, you know, um, are getting in trouble, right? They're trying to defend their border. And now the Quraysh actually went and they spoke with the Jewish tribes to try and come inside. Okay, and so there's an enemy inside who's letting the Quraysh come in from the back door and there's enemy outside. Okay, so just one second, guys. So the enemy was there and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he sent, an ar he, sent a wind he sent wind and an army that they could not see, right? So alhamdulillah, what happened, the Quraysh had to leave that place in about two months because they could not stay for any more, right? They could not cross over. So Ahzab was a victory for Muslims, right? They were not able, the 10,000 people were not able to defeat the Muslims. Now what happened exactly, so Battle of Ahzab happened in fifth Hijri, okay? Five years after the Prophet Sallallahu migrated to Medina. Exactly after one year, okay? Exactly after one year, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gets a dream, okay? What is the dream he's seeing? He sees that he is doing tawaf around the Kaaba, okay? And he is shaving his head, okay? What does that mean? That means Allah is telling him he should go and perform Umrah. He should go and do tawaf and shave his head. That happens in Umrah, right? Tawaf shows that he will start the Umrah and shaving shows that he will complete his Umrah. And where do you perform Umrah? How many of you know where do you perform Umrah? Who can tell me? Where do you perform Amra? Which city? Mecca. Mecca. Very good. We go to Mecca and perform Amra. And you know what happened? Last year, last year, this very Meccans, the Quraysh, with 10,000 people came to destroy the Muslims. And now the Muslims are supposed to go to their place and do tawaf. Is that a good idea? Mm -mm. It's like putting your hand in the lion's mouth, you know, telling the lion, hey, open your mouth when they put my hand inside you, right, and bite. It's not a, bad, not a good idea, but the Prophet Sallallahu dream or revelation, Allah is telling him that this is what you should do. And so the Prophet says, this is Allah's command, I'm gonna do it. And so the Muslims, they were always about obeying Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, okay? This is what the companions are about. They obey the messenger of Allah because the messenger of Allah is guided by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Anytime we follow the sunnah, we're always going to be successful, even though it might look that it's bad for us. Okay, so 1,400 Muslims, 1,400 Muslims, they say, yes, Ya Rasulullah, we'll go with you. And the Prophet Sallallahu puts his ihram on, you know, the white clothes that people wear on going for Hajj. So the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions, they put the ihram on. And usually what happens is the Prophet Sallallahu when he is uh, going uh, to the enemy, he would take the opposite side. Just if he's going on a war, he would take the opposite side just to confuse the enemy, right? So if you imagine if this is Mecca and this is Medina, if the Prophet was to attack, he would just take the opposite side and then come and attack that, right? So he would go on the opposite side to just confuse uh, the enemy. This time, he does not go in the opposite. He just goes away, you know, in, in that direction of Mecca, right? And he's wearing ihram. And he leaves in the month of Dhul Qaeda, in the 11th month, okay, of the Islamic calendar. For those of you who know, the 11th month, Dhul Qaeda, is a, a sacred month where there's no fighting. So you tell me, did the Prophet Wasallam have any intentions to fight? No. No. Right? There's no, no. intention to fight. He is going, he is going no. to just perform Umrah. That's all. Okay. And now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam leaves and he stops at a place called Dhul Hulayfa. Okay, so, if you, so it's okay if you don't remember this. He stops at Dhul Hulayfa and he prays two rakah 
right? Intending the, to, raka, to intend for Umrah. And then he sends a companion. His name was Busar, okay? B-U-S-A-R, Busar, okay? And he is neither a Meccan nor a, nor a resident of Medina, okay? He was from Khuza'a tribe. Okay? He's, a, he's a foreigner or like a different tribe. So he sends him to go and check what the Meccans are up to, right? Are they planning to fight? Let me, let me know what the condition is. So Busar goes and he finds out that Meccans are actually preparing to attack the Muslims. Meccans are saying that they're not going to let the Muslims come in for Umrah and they have got their women and children. You know, when the, when the Arabs get their women and children in the battle, that means it's going to be an intense battle and they're not going to go back. If they, if they even think about running away from the battlefield, they will realize that their wife and children are in the battlefield, so they will not go. So Busar goes and he finds out the Meccans are ready to fight. And he comes back to the Prophet Sallallahu but the Prophet already marches closer to Mecca and he stops at a place called Asfan. Okay, what I will do, um, let me just, uh, Subhan, allow me to share the screen. So you guys, I just wanna show you guys what's happening here. Okay, all right, so here's my beautiful drawing for those of you Whatever this. Okay, so here imagine this is like the Arabian Peninsula, okay? Right, it's a beautiful drawing right there. So you got over here, Medina. Okay, got Medina over here. Where's Mecca? Right around here. Okay, this is Mecca. And the Prophet stops at a place called Asfan. Okay, I'll just put A over there. Okay, so he stops over right here. So by the time Busar comes back, the Prophet already stops here. So Busar meets the Prophet at Asfan and he says that, Ya Rasulullah, the Meccans are ready to fight. Uh, they're going to uh, attack. And the Prophet وسلم, he says that, what's wrong with the Quraysh? Why do they have to fight me? I am from them. Why are they fighting? Why not the other Arabs? And they said, they are going to uh, if they, if they, um, if they're going to have all of the meat of these animals, you know, the Prophet you know, when he goes for Umrah, he takes a lot of animals with him, sacrificial animals. The Prophet himself had 70, uh, you know, uh, camels, you know, in this journey, his own 70 camels, he was going to slaughter it in, in the Masjid al-Haram, right, in, in Mecca. And so all, all the Sahabas had their animals, so there's a lot of animals that they're taking with them to go to Kaaba and perform Umrah. Right? And so the Prophet says that what is wrong with them, right? They're going to have all of these animals meat. You know, when you slaughter the animal in Mecca, all of the meat has to go to the people, right? In Mecca. So they are going to get rich. They're going to have a lot of business, right? So he says, why are they doing that? I swear to God. He says, I swear to Allah, I will keep struggling until this, this soul leaves this body. Like, I'm not going to give up on this. If they don't, I'm not going to give up on performing the Umrah. This is a command of Allah. The people... They say um, the people are ready for war. And then he says, and then he prays Salatul Khawf. The Prophet prays to Raqqa, Salatul Khawf, Salah of fear. Then the Prophet uh, then he turns to the crowd, right? He turns to all the people. He says, you guys, all of you, companions, should we go and fight the ones who fought us last year? What do you guys think? He's checking the crowd. What do you guys think about this? And he says, if, if we fight them, then a big portion of them will be cut off. They're going to lose, and a big portion of the mushrikeen is going to be cut off. What do you think? And Abu Bakr Siddiq, he gets up and says, Ya Rasulullah, you came, you did not come out with the intention of fighting. You came out with the intention of going to the house of Allah. And also says, okay, let's, let's continue. Now, what the Prophet Sallallahu is doing is not saying that we should go and fight. He's checking the pulse of the people. Like, what do you guys think, right? And Abu Bakr recognizes this. He says, okay, no, the Prophet actually came for Umrah and he's trying to speak for the crowd saying that, no, Ya Rasulullah, you came for the intention. He's saying, we are with you, go ahead. And so now you should imagine guys, the Sahabas are really, really en en enraged, right? Because they were persecuted, tortured for so many years. They left their own homes, right? Uh, uh, because, because of the Meccans. Okay, and so the Prophet Sallallahu continues. So on the, then what happens is on the road to Asfan, I'll just um, show you guys right here. 
So this is Asfan, and there's a road that leads straight to Mecca. Okay, this is the road to Asfan. Right over here, there was an ambush that was prepared, okay, by Khalid bin Walid leading the army. And he says that any time, as soon as the Muslims come from Medina, this is the only road to enter into Mecca. Okay, as soon as the Muslims enter, I'm gonna attack them, and I'm gonna kill all of them, right? The Prophet knew that Khalid bin Walid is there, you know, waiting for an ambush. So he tells the companions, is there anyone who knows a different route to Mecca? We don't want to fight. We just came here, uh, you know, for, for peace. And we're going to perform Umar and leave. We want to fight. We, won't, we will not take this path. Is there a different path that anyone knows? And so the Prophet uh, was asking and only one companion says, I know a path. And this path will lead us through Hudaybiyah. Okay, so this is the key uh, city to remember or a place, okay, Hudaybiyah. It's not a city actually. So he says, you, uh, we can enter, we can cross the valley into Hudaybiyah and then enter into Mecca, okay? But he says, this path is a difficult path, okay? Because there's a lot of thorns, there's a lot of, um, you know, um, bushes and whatnot. It's not an easy path. There's just, just one well in Hudaybiyah. So it's very difficult. It is like killing yourself. The Prophet says, inshallah, let's make our way through Hudaybiyah. So they, they take the path of Hudaybiyah. Now what happens next is that, um, you know, the Quraysh were waiting, right? Um, and um, you have Khalid bin Walid, right? So on, on the way, on their way to Hudaybiyah, the Prophet Sallallahu he says to the companions, this path of yours is like a path Bani Israel took, uh, you know, to the uh, to the sacred uh, city, right? Um, just one second, guys. Just, uh, Subhan, can you just get the uh, hosting powers and just give me the option to share the screen, inshallah. There's a lot of people just coming in. Okay, perfect. All right, sorry guys. So <clears throat> now the Prophet Sallallahu he takes, the Muslims are taking this journey through Hudaybiyah, right? And it's a very difficult, their feet are all, you know, bleeding, right? Their slippers are all like melted, right? Because of the heat of the sun and they, um, are really angry too. They're saying like, we would rather kill the Quraysh and spill their blood than to, you know, see this blood because of what we are going through because of them. This house of Allah, Mecca is the house of Allah. And because of them, we can't do anything. Anyways, now they continue. And the Prophet ﷺ says that all of you will enter Jannah except for the man in the red camel, right? All of you, all of you people who are traveling with me to Hudaybiyah, all of you are going to be entering into Jannah, except for the man in the red camel. And they all looked around like, who is the man with the red camel? We don't see. And then they saw at the end of the line, there was a man who was looking for a red camel, right? And he was asking, is there anyone, is there anyone who saw my red camel? And the prophet and, and the companions went to him and said, hey, look, forget about your red camel. There are a group, uh, the prophet says that you are not entering Jannah. You better ask for Allah's forgiveness, the prophet forgiveness, because you know, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu did not make dua for you. He says, you're not entering Jannah. So this man says, uh, I have other things to do. I'd rather go and look for my camel than to ask forgiveness from your Prophet, right? To show what? That all the companions in this journey were sincere and loyal to the Prophet Sallallahu except for this one uh, man. And so the Prophet says he will not be entering Jannah. Anyways, they get through the valley of, uh, of Hudaybiyah and the Prophet Sallallahu camel just stops. Right, as if like he'd ran out of gas or something, you know, just transmission problem just stops right there. And the Prophet says, Hal, Hal, Hal is a language used for camel to say, Move, move, let's go. And uh, the name of the Prophet's camel was Qaswa, right? So he says, Qaswa, Hal, Hal, right? Move, move. And the, pro and the people started saying, Ya Rasulullah, Qaswa has gone bad, you know, is something wrong with her. The Prophet says, No, nothing is wrong with the camel. And he says something beautiful at this point. He says, the one who stopped the elephants stopped her. Prophet is making a connection here. The one who stopped the elephants stopped her. What does that mean? Can someone tell me? 
Yeah, Allah stopped. Allah stopped her. What is the the one who stopped the elephants? What does it mean, elephants? Isn't it the incident before the Prophet ﷺ was born, where a bunch of elephants was coming to the Quraysh or the Kaaba? Excellent, excellent, exactly. Good job for us. So he's making a connection to the time when Mecca was rescued. Remember, before the Amul Fil, when elephants came to destroy the Kaaba, Allah stopped the elephants to free the Kaaba. Allah is telling, uh, the Prophet is hinting here that this journey that you and me are taking is a journey to liberate the Kaaba, right? That animal was stopped to rescue Kaaba and this animal is stopped right here because Allah wants to rescue the Kaaba again. And so then people are worried, what do we do? There's nothing, no food here, no grass, and we're gonna, we're gonna die soon. And they only had one well. And if you imagine, there are so many animals with them and 1400 people, one well is not enough. So within hours, the entire well was dry. There was not as, there's nothing left. Everything was dry, just a few drops were left. So the Prophet uh, you know, they go to Prophet and say, Ya Rasulullah, everything is gone, what do we do? The Prophet says, bring those few drops that are left and he makes wudu in that water and they throw that wudu water of the Prophet into the well. Right, the Prophet swims with the water, they throw it into the well, and the water starts oozing out, and the water starts flowing again. Alhamdulillah, the well continued to uh, go. And now the Prophet وسلم, at this point, he sees the companion's morale is up, right? They see a, a miracle of, of Rasulullah, they see that this is a messenger of Allah, their iman is renewed again. You know, they are, they are thinking in their head, you know, what are we doing? Right? Why are we so scared of them? Why can't we just go and fight and take the Kaaba? Right? Why should we have to follow the Prophet? But they see this, you know, miracle, the Iman is renewed. And at that point, the Prophet says something. All of this, by the way, will make sense towards the end. So you have to listen to every single detail I'm telling you guys. Only then you will understand the surah, Surah Al-Fatih. And so the Prophet says, I swear to God, I swear by Allah, as long as they don't ask me to do haram, I will give it to them. What is he saying? As long as the Quraysh... Don't ask me to do something haram, I'll give to them. He's hinting that the Quraysh are going to have a negotiation. There's going to be a back and forth talking happening. And they are going to tell me to accept some terms. And he says, I'm going to give it to them as long as they don't ask me to do something haram. Muslims don't understand what's happening, but they just continue. Uh, so then what happens is Khalid bin Ulid, remember? He was waiting for an ambush, right? Right on the road from Asfahan to uh, Medina. So he goes and says, there's no Muslims here, what happened? No one came yet. So he goes all the way to Asfahan, says there are no Muslims, but he sees the traces going to Hudaybiyah. And he recognized, oh my God, these guys are taking a different route, right? A, um, so he comes back to Quraysh and says, guys, we have to rethink now. Muslims are taking a different route. What do we do? So now the Quraysh are thinking, okay, what do we do? We can't go and attack them directly, right? So why don't we do something? Why don't we send like 80 soldiers cover them up, you know, like have their faces covered. And why don't we just secretly send them? So they go and kill as many Muslims as possible and come back. So likewise, they send this this uh, 80 soldiers. The Prophet is really intelligent, very smart, strong. And so what happens is he, you know, he, he ambushes them before they ambush the companions, right? And basically he does not kill a single person. He just takes their weapons Right, he captures them, takes the weapons, sends them back, back to Mecca. Right, go back. And so these, you know, soldiers are like, oh my God, you know what happened? Now, the Quraysh then send a man. Okay, now there's a negotiation happening. Right, there's like back and forth talks gonna happen. Okay, so we want you guys to listen to this carefully, inshallah, uh, to really understand what the surah is gonna be uh, telling us. Now, what happened is now the Quraysh. Okay, the Quraysh are gonna send a man from Banu Khuzaa. Okay, Banu Khuzaa. Banu Khuzaa, remember Busa? He was also from Banu Khuzaa. It's a different tribe. Okay, neither a Qureshi tribe nor from the Ansars of Medina, right? So, so they send Khuzaa to go talk to the Muslims. So he goes to the Muslims and he says, You Muslims, man, the Quraysh have brought their women and children. They have a huge army prepared. You are no match to them. You better go back, right? You better go back and they won't let you do any Umrah. The Prophet replies to him, he says, if Quraysh won't make a want more time, then I will give it to them. They can go to the outside valley and wait until we perform the Umrah, but I am not leaving until I perform the Umrah. I'm not gonna leave. 
And so he says, I'm going to fight until Allah decides between us. And I'm going to let this go. And so this man from Banu Khuza'a, right? He goes back to the Quraysh. He says, guys, look, I, I see like they have brought a lot of animals with them. They have come with Umrah. They don't have armor or anything like that. They don't have any intentions to fight. They will just come for Umrah. They will perform the Umrah and leave. I suggest you let them come, perform the Umrah and go. Al-Qaeda say, hey, who are you, by the way? Right, get lost. He, they speak to him in a rude manner. You get lost. You know, we don't want you. Right? So this person from Banu Khuza, you know, he sees like, oh my God, this Quraysh, we respected them because they used to host the people. Right? They, they, they welcomed the people for Umrah and Hajj. That's why we respected them. We respected them for the Kaaba. And now they are, you know, not letting these people come in for, for, for Umrah and Hajj. How could they? So they are slowly, you should understand. I'll go to the political analysis later on, but you should understand what's happening there. Okay. So anyways, so he leaves. Then the Quraysh, they choose another man. Who do they choose this time? They choose uh, a, a person by the name of Urwa bin Mas'ud. Urwa bin Mas'ud al thaqafi Okay. He was from the Thaqif tribe. You remember Taif, right? Taif was uh, from Thaqif also, but with Thaqif, right? So he was from that tribe. And so he was a leader of that tribe, Urwa bin Mas'ud. Okay, Jazakallah for Subhan, which we're taking the notes. Um, so Urwa bin Mas'ud, they send him and they, they, have, they say, go and persuade the Muslims not to come in. So he goes and he sees, you know, like all kinds of people with the Muslims, right? Urwa has only seen like tribe people, you know? So he sees like, like, Hey, Muslim, like, what have you guys brought? Like, I see, like, black, brown, yellow, pink, you know, all kinds of people amongst you, you know. They see Bilal bin Habshi over there and Abu Bakr and, like, you know, Mu'ad uh, uh, bin Jabal, all kinds of people from and Salman al-Farisi from Persia, like, all kinds of, like, what are you guys doing? You know, Quraysh, they are very strong. You guys have no backing, you know. It's I, I know, I warn you, don't go. Just go back home. If anything happens, you guys don't have any backing. Let's go back. And, you know, and he says, and he starts like kind of insulting the Muslims. At that point, a companion, he comes and says some words that I can't say what happened. Okay. Swear words, really, really insulting swear words that you can look it up later, inshallah, that, you know, is just like throws them out of his mind. Like, who said that? He asked, like, who was that? Now, you imagine the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rabbi Masood is there, and 1,400 people gathering, and someone says that he doesn't know who says. So he asked, like, who said that? He says, it was Abu Bakr. <laughs> imagine, guys, Abu Bakr, the innocent, the philosophical, right? The, uh, you know, the Siddiq Abu Bakr said these words. And so he gets really, really upset. And then what happens, Urwa bin Masood then, you know, he tries to grab the beard of the Prophet ﷺ. Not to hurt him, but you know, in the in the Arab tradition, if they want you to listen to something, they will just grab your beard like this and they will like, you know, like say like, hey, listen to me. And then he's like, yeah, I'm listening. <laughs> so he grabbed, he's about to grab the beard of the Prophet ﷺ and he gets like hit on the hand. Like someone hits him really hard. Like, ow, right? He takes his hand off. And then again, he's about to grab the beard of the Prophet ﷺ. Someone hits again. Oh, shoot. Right? It's like, who did that? Again, he goes, again, he gets hit. Then he asks, like, who was that? He can't see, right? Because a lot of people there, he doesn't know which where the hand came from. And you know who it was? It was his own nephew, Arwa bin Masood's nephew. He says, hey, Chacha, you know, it's me. <laughs> right? And Arwa bin Masood, he sees this, oh my God, these guys are just some next level. You know, for Arwa bin Masood, for, for the Arabs, association was based on either tribalism or family, right? If you belong to the same tribe, you know, if you're all from the same country or same tribe, you will support each other. Or if you're from the same family, you will support each other. Here, Urwa, say, Urwa says that Arab, Abu Bakr is Arab, right? So I'm saying, you know, uh, elite, elite tribe. He is, you know, loyal to the Prophet Sallallahu and he's not letting, you know, he's using curse words against me. And he sees that his own nephew is against him and he's loyal to the Prophet Sallallahu and so he's amazed by this. He immediately leaves that gathering and he goes to the Quraysh. He says, Quraysh, and these are the most important words to understand, to really understand the loyalty of the companions to the Prophet. He says, Oh people, I have been to the courts of Caesar and Khusros. I have been to the courts of kings and even to the Najashi, to the Nagus, right? I swear to God, 
I have never seen anyone who are so devoted to their leader like the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I've never seen this loyalty, this companionship like the companions had for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he continues on. He says, if he would spit, he, he would not spit except that it would land in the companion's hand, right? Meaning that like they just were right there with him like assisting him and being with him in every, if a drop of sweat leaves his body, they would catch it, right? Before it hits the ground. When he commands them, they are the first ones to fulfill his commands. As soon as the prophet says something, what happens? The companions are the first ones to do it. When he washes his hands for wudu, they would fight to collect that water. When he speaks, they lower their voices, okay? When he speaks, they lower their voices. They don't even make eye contact with him. They are in awe of him. Let him do what he wants to. He won't harm you. Oh, people, accept what he says. I fear that the loyalty he has with people, you don't even have with yours. I fear that the, companion, the, the loyalty the companions have for Rasulullah, you don't even have, again, amongst yourself. Okay? So I'll repeat those things one more time uh, for the, for the note, note taker, inshallah. So he says, and these are important to understand uh, what fatah, fat you know, this is what fatahna is. We'll talk about that, inshallah. I'll go on it right now. So again, he says, O oh people, I've been to the courts of Caesars and Khusros and Najashi. I have, I swear to God, I have never seen anyone who are so devoted to their leader like the companions of Rasulullah He would not spit except that it would land in the companion's hand. If a drop of sweat leaves his body, they would catch it. When he commands them, they are the first ones to fulfill his commands. When he washes his hands for wudu, they would fight to collect that water. Whenever he speaks, they lower their voices. They don't even make eye contact with him. They are in awe of him. Let him do what he wants to do. He won't harm you. Okay, and so he says that. What happens then? What is the Quraysh? What is the Quraysh response? Yo, hey, get lost, you know, get lost, you know, like, and he insults this is the leader of Banu, Banu Thaqif, right? He insults him. Banu Thaqif is like, you guys, Quraysh, we respected you because of you taking care of the pilgrims. You were doing that, you know. I'm not gonna have any, any, anything. Nah. Mah, get lost. Like he said, Mah means like shut up, you know, get lost. So they speak to the negotiator in a negative way, right? Mm -hmm. So Quraysh is slowly losing the respect. Now what happens then? Muslims are going to send a negotiator from them, okay? Muslims are going to send Quraysh. Quraysh, they send Quraysh on top of the, the camel of Rasulullah Sassim, on Qaswa, right? Uh, and everybody recognized the camel, you know, like you could recognize the car of someone, they could recognize the camel of Rasulullah Sassim, they send him. What was the response of Quraysh? Do they accept uh, the negotiation? No. They start beating Khirash, right? They're beating him up, right? And then he runs back to Mecca, right? Um, uh, sorry, runs back to Medina with the camel, right? So they don't, they're not ready to accept anything. Then what happens? The Quraysh send a third negotiator. Okay, you guys are with me so far? Thumbs up. Yeah. All right. All right, alhamdulillah. Now the Quraysh are going to send a third negotiator and his name was, uh, he, he was a man from Kinana. Name is not important. He was a man from Kinana, another tribe. So the first tribe was Khuza'a. Second tribe was Thaqif. Third tribe is Kinana. So they'd send a man from Kinana and Kina people from Kinana are very religious people. They're very you know, uh, spiritual people, you know, and he starts coming from far, the Prophet sees from far, okay, this is a man from Kinana, oh, these people are very close to, you know, worship and spirituality, you know what the Prophet does? He gets all of his uh, camels and goats and sheep in front, right, the sacrificial animals, and he tells the companions to say, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik ala sharik ala labbaik, starts saying that, Right? And Kinana, you know, he comes, he says, Oh my God, there are so many animals for sacrifice. These people have come for Hajj to the house of Allah. Right? And he gets closer and he hears, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik. Oh my God, these people are so good. Right? Why are they stopping these people? You know, he doesn't even come and talk to the Prophet. He turns right there, says, Quraysh, what's wrong with you? We have come with a lot of animals right there. Right? They're not going to harm you. Right? Let them come. 
says, hey, Kinana, you know, get lost. Again, same response. You know, we don't need you. You know, we didn't, we, we didn't ask you to tell us, tell, tell us what to do. Know your position, get lost. And so again, Kinana says, I have no affiliation with you, Quraysh. I'm going to tell my tribe to cut relationship with you. You guys are not good to the pilgrims. Now the Prophet then decides to send a... Now the Prophet sends a companion, okay, a messenger, and this was Uthman bin Affan. The Prophet sends Uthman bin Affan or Uthman, you are a Quraysh leader as well, you know, from the tribe. So you go and talk. So Uthman goes, and Uthman was stopped at the entrance, but then you know, uh, we didn't let him go, but then his cousin was there, so he let him go inside. And Uthman and Abu Sufyan were actually close cousins, okay, first cousins. And so he goes to Abu Sufyan, he says, Abu Sufyan. Let us come in. We'll perform Umrah and leave. We will not do anything to you guys. We didn't come to fight. Abu Sufyan, he says something important here. He says, we will not let the Arabs say that these Muslims got the better of the Quraysh. The reason why they don't want to let the Muslims come for Umrah is because the people will say, oh my God, Quraysh got owned. You know why? Because people will say last year, these, Muslim, uh, the, these people went to attack the Muslims with 10,000 people, nothing happened. They came right there, performed Umrah and left. They got owned. So they don't want that to happen, right? That's why. So Abu Sufyan says, we don't want the Arabs to say this will happen, right? The, the, the Muslims got the better of us. And so what happened is Uthman goes, and you know, in Mecca, there were a lot of prisoners of war. Prisoners of war are people, you know, who were, um, are also like Muslims, weak Muslims. They were, they were Muslims, but they could not express or they were being persecuted, they were being beaten up because they, be, they became Muslims, okay? So Uthman Rabi Allah, he goes and checks up on the prisoners of war and uh, on, on these weak Muslims. And he goes from different tribes asking them for help, right? To let the Muslims come in. So he got, he got delayed. Now the Muslims are waiting, you know, in the camp waiting for Uthman to come back with the news. You know, they're all in small circles. And one of them, you know, as they're sitting and they're talking, Uthman did not come yet. Hmm, maybe, maybe he got killed. What happened to Uthman? And the guy from the other camp is like, Uthman killed? Hey, did you hear that? Did, did Uthman get killed? Yeah, I don't know. Let me ask the other, other guy. So he goes to the other circle. Hey, do you know if Uthman got killed? And then, you know, in a few minutes, that just rumor spreads. It's just like, you know, they don't know. They're ignorant. When two ignorant people come together, you know, if you're in doubt and the other person's doubt, and then... You know, what happens? That becomes like a conviction. Uthman got killed. And then some, find, you know, some people go on, you know, imagine like in today's time, right? Today's time. Oh, that, you know, that person um, got, I don't know, um, you know, that, that sheikh got divorced. Billah, right? The sheikh got divorced. And then you start typing this on Facebook, you know, did the sheikh get divorced? Question mark. Right, and a few minutes later, what happens? The sheikh got divorced, exclamation. Right, the things get spread like that, right? So in the Muslim camp, what happened? Everybody is like, you know, confused and they all are, are like, oh my God, Uthman got killed. They killed Uthman and it became like a like a thing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not, you know, spread, does not tell the reality. He kept it hidden. He kept this rumor continue. And then what happened? The Prophet calls for an oath. He calls for an oath. He says, all the companions come here. So they all gather under a tree. And the Prophet extends his hand and he says, who is ready to fight for Uthman, to avenge the death of Uthman? And all the companions, they give their oath, their bay'ah, right? Oath of Ridwan. This is called Bayt al-Ridwan. And, and Allah says, Allah's hand was on top of their hand. It's the oath they took. And you know why this oath is important? Because they are ready to fight, uh, to obey the Prophet Sallallahu And they're ready to basically kill themselves because what's happening there? Right? They didn't come with any uh, weapons to fight. Right? So they, are, they said they're, gonna, they're ready to fight. And the Prophet says that everybody who took the oath is guaranteed Jannah. So as they are ready to fight, they're enraged. Yeah, let's go. You know, this Quraysh, what have they done? They're so angry. And as they're about to take the sword ready to go, they see Uthman coming. You know, like, hey, Uthman. <laughs> you know, when you're angry, you can't calm down like that. You? You? Hey, no fair. You got to see the Kaaba. We didn't see the Kaaba. They just, you know, random. Like, what? I didn't, you did Tawaf. We didn't do Tawaf. You know, and like, they're confused. Like, what? He's confused. Like, like why are you guys so angry? No, they go to Prophet Ya Rasulullah, Uthman is here. But he got to see the Kaaba. He did Tawaf. We didn't. 
No, I would never do tawaf without the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says, you know, and so basically the Quraysh are like, you know, imagine the Muslims, right? The Muslims are in, in, in rage, like different things are going in their minds, right? A roller coaster of emotions, right? Up and down, up and down. Anyways, then the Quraysh, the Muslims wait and the Quraysh send a final person and his name was Mikras. They see Mikras, the Prophet sees Mikras coming. And he said, this guy is a thug, you know, it's a, it's a bad person. And it's not going to be good news. And right behind Mikras, the, the Prophet some sees Suhail bin Amr. Okay, most important name, guys. Suhail bin Amr. Okay, Suhail bin Amr. I'm almost done with the story, inshallah. So they see Suhail bin Amr. Suhail bin Amr was the leader of the Quraysh. And so the Prophet some sees Suhail. If you know what Suhail means, Suhail comes from Sahal, which means ease. And the Prophet said he plays on words. It says Suhail has come, so things will become easy. Things are going to become easy because of Suhail. And so Suhail comes and something, a few more things about Suhail bin Amr, okay? Suhail bin Amr had two sons, okay? Suhail bin Amr has two sons. One of the sons' name is Abdullah. The other name's son is Abu Jandal, okay? Abdullah and Abu Jandal. Abdullah and Abu Jandal both became Muslims, okay? Abdullah, he you know, comes with his father in battle of Badr, okay, with his father. He doesn't show he's a Muslim. He comes to his father saying that he's a non-Muslim. He comes and right before the battle began, he took his horse, ran to the other side. That was Abdullah, okay? And you know, in the battle of Badr, Muslims won and there were some prisoners of war. And Suhaib bin Amr was also a prisoner of war. You know, he was kept in the prison in the Muslim camp. And you know who was a prison guard of Suhaib bin Amr? His own son, Abdullah. So Suhaib is like really angry with the son really angry with the Muslims because of what they have done to, him, to, to his sons, right? And so that is Abdullah. Abu Jandal, what about Abu Jandal? Abu Jandal, he became Muslim too, but he could not escape like Abdullah. So he was put in the prison and he was in the dungeons and he was tortured and persecuted. He was in chains, there was bruises, cuts, everything, right? So from, for four years almost, from since, since Badr, he's been persecuted and, you know, uh, and, and, um, and tortured. So that's those are the two, uh, you know, sons. So now Suhaib bin Amr, he enters, and Suhaib bin Amr was a spokesman of Quraysh. Anytime the Quraysh had to send someone, like Suhaib, Suhaib bin Amr will be sent, and he was, you know, he used to insult the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a lot. So when he sees when Umar radiAllahu anh, when he sees Suhaib bin Amr, you know what he says? Hey, Rasulullah, give me the permission. I'm gonna grab this guy, pluck his front two teeth, take his tongue out, and cut, chop his, you know, cut his tongue. You know, the Prophet says, Ya Rasulullah, oh, Umar, you know, I am a prophet. I am, you know, we are not sent to mutilate people. I'm sent as a mercy to mankind and I'm not sent to mutilate anyone. And so, so Ibn Amr, he enters and there he says, let's sit down and have a negotiation. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. So Ibn Amr and they, the Prophet has someone on one side, so Ibn Amr on the other side, they sit on a table and all the Muslims are surrounded. They're so angry at what happened, right? So really, really, you know, what has happened? What they, they had anger from Uthman radiallahu and they had to go to that valley. You know, they have left their homes. You can imagine all kinds of things. They are their own people were persecuted and killed in Badr, Uhud, and even they came to kill Ahzab and kill an Ahzab. All things are happening. So now, Suhaib bin Amr, uh, the Prophet starts and he tells the writer to write Bismillah Rahman Rahim. So he says, hey, hey, stop, stop, stop. Rahman. We don't know who Rahman is. We don't believe in Rahman. Say Bismik Allahum in the name of Allah, like the way you used to read right before. And Muslims are getting so angry. What? What is a negotiation? What is what is a deal without the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Then the negotiation, the writer writes, right? A contract between Muhammadun Rasulullah and Suhail bin Amr. Right? And Suhail bin Amr said, hey, well, hold up, hold up, hold up there. Muhammad Rasulullah. We don't believe in Rasulullah. If we believe in Rasulullah, we, be, we won't be having this conversation today. So he says, remove the word Rasulullah from there. Muslims are even more angry. Rasulullah, they now they don't remove that name? How could they do that? How could they do that? The Prophet says, fine, right? Muhammad bin Abdullah. Muhammad the son of Abdullah. And then he goes on and the Prophet says, we are going to perform Umrah. So he says, nope. We are not going to perform Umrah this year. And Muslims are even more angry now. What? We can't perform Umrah today? Right? This year? What? And then Suhail continues. And if 
And, and at that point, he says the same word that Abu Sufyan says, because we are not going to let the Arabs get the better of you. Right? We were not going to let the Arabs say that the Muslims got the better of us. Right? We will not let that happen. We will maintain our respect. We will not let you do Umrah this year. And he says, the next clause, he says in the, in the treaty, this is a treaty, okay, a contract at Hudaybiyah. This is called the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, right? And he says, if, a, if any man from Makkah, that's the thing, guys, if any man from Makkah runs away to come to Medina, okay, he has to be returned to his owner. He has to be returned, okay? Right when he says that, guess what happens? Abu Jandal, remember his other son, Abu Jandal? He comes running. Muslims, Muslims, I have come. I have come. Help me, help me. And Prophet sees Abu Jandal, right? And Sohail says, we will start with this first. He has to be returned because he remember he came ran from Makkah. He has to be returned. The prophet says, you know, we didn't write it yet. Nope. If you don't let me take him back, this contract is done, right? We won't negotiate with you. The prophet says, you know, at least for this one, this one, you know, at least for this one, let it go. Nope, I'm not going to let this go. The prophet pleads that Sohail bin Amr, please, could you, you know, just do some fafal, you know, just do some favor, you know, Nope, I'm not gonna let let this person go. This son, my son of my son Abu Jandal, is gonna go back. I'm gonna continue. And but he says, you know, I'm not gonna torture him. Is that okay with you? Fine. And so you know, the Muslims are enraged again. Imagine, guys, your brother was tortured for so many years, you know, and now he's taken back to Mecca. And he says, oh, Muslims, are you really going to let me go to the Mushrikeen who will torture me and revert me from my religion? The Prophet says to Abu Jandal, Abu Jandal, be patient soon. Allah will make a way out for you. And those in Mecca will also come out uh, come out with you, inshallah. And then the part of the treaty continues. The next part of the treaty was there will be no fight for 10 years. The Muslims will not fight for 10 years. That means they cannot liberate Kaaba for 10 years. And they said that you cannot perform Umrah this year. You have to come next year and you can only stay for three days. And if anyone from Medina goes to Mecca, then they will not be returned. Okay, so these are the clauses. Now imagine Suhail grabs Abu Jandal and he leaves. Umar gets, and a whole crowd is angry. Okay, this is a climax now. Okay, the whole crowd is like, oh my God, how could this happen? And Umar snaps. You know what he says? Ya Rasulullah, aren't you the messenger of Allah? He speaks loudly to the Prophet. The Prophet says, yes, I am. Aren't we on the truth? The Prophet says, yes, we are on the truth. Aren't they on falsehood? Aren't they wrong? The Prophet says, yes. Then why are you, you know, lowering your hand? Why are you lowering your hand? And you know what? No one stopped Umar. No one said, hey, don't speak like that to Rasulullah. Because Umar was the voice of the crowd. Everyone was feeling like this. Everyone is feeling enraged at what has happened and why the Prophet is agreeing and pleading with them and agreeing to these terms, right? And then he goes to Abu Bakr. He says, Abu Bakr, isn't he the messenger of Allah? Aren't we in the truth? Is he, aren't they on the falsehood? Why do we have to submit to them? You know, when you get frustrated, when you're angry, you repeat the same thing again and again and again. And Abu Bakr, he says, Oh, Omar, he is the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? And he is guided by Allah. He never disobeys Allah. You better hold your horse, son. Messenger of Allah is on the truth. Do not let your anger go. Uh, go. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then he commands the companions after this. Stand up, sacrifice your animals, and shave your heads. No one moves. Stand up. Sacrifice your animals and shave your heads. No movement. Stand up. Sacrifice your animals and shave your heads. Nobody moves. Shocked. Anger. Frustration. This is the nation of Samirna Waltana. What has happened to this nation? This is a nation that took the oath under the tree, saying that we're ready to die for Uthman, for the cause of Islam. The nation that was ready to leave, the best nation, the nation of Abu, with Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Sabi Mu'ad, you know, all kinds of people, best nation. 
the Prophet ﷺ was really, you know, sad. He goes to his uh, his wife, Um Salama, says, they're not listening to me. Um Salama says, Ya Rasulullah, you go and slaughter your animal and shave your head, they will follow you. And the Prophet does that, and slowly the companions start to continue, right? They start to slaughter the animals and they shave their heads. And you know what the worst part is now? The meat that they sacrifice, all of the meat that they sacrifice is going to go to the Quraysh, to the Meccans. You know, you just got slapped, right? And here you're saying, here's a gift for slapping, slapping us. Imagine that feeling. But you know what's important here? At any cost, they had to control their emotions and obey us. We'll get to that inshallah in a few minutes. So, and you know what they what the Muslims do? They, they slaughter the animals like the Prophet tells them to do after like three commands, right? But they slaughter the camel of Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl. You know, Abu Jahl from Badr, they had his camel. So they brought that camel to, they slaughter his camel. They put his head, the camel's head on the, on the plate and they send that first before sending the rest of the meat as if giving a signal, you know, don't think you're over with this, you know? So they send that. The Prophet ﷺ, um, you know, he, uh, they, they do that and the Muslims start to head back. How do you go back from Hudaybiyah? Who can tell me? Which path do you take from Hudaybiyah back to Medina? Where do you have to pass by? The Asfahan. Asfahan, mashallah, very good. Asfahan. They have to pass from Asfahan. You know that? And that place is very thorny, right? Rugged, difficult path. Now they have to go through that path again. They're all so worried, they don't even feel pain. All that they're going through. And you know what happens? Umar radiallahu an, he's like, oh my God, what did I do? I snapped at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I shouldn't have done that. He goes, you know, he goes with his horse. He speeds up his horse, uh, his ammo a little bit. He says, Ya Rasulullah, can I talk to you? You have a few minutes? The Prophet does not respond. Umar goes back. And then he comes up again. Ya Rasulullah, can I talk to you? The Prophet does not respond. He goes back. He's like, oh Umar, you're done. You are destroyed. You are a hypocrite now. How could you do that? Allah has revealed ayat about you saying you're a hypocrite. You're done. Omar, what have you done? And so Rasulullah, in a few minutes, he gets so happy. His, the Sahabas could see the smile on his face, all his teeth. Extremely happy. Wait a minute. A few minutes ago, they were just so sad, worried, all kinds of emotions. Why is the Prophet Sallallahu so happy? What do you think happened to you in this in this few minutes? I Any more to yes? The surah was revealed. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Quran was revealed. Very good. Quran was revealed. Quran was revealed. That surah was Surah Al-Fatih. The surah we will be studying, inshallah. This, these 29 ayats, surah number 48, was revealed entire surah in one go. You know how the surah begins? Sorry? Surah Fatih. The entire surah, the entire surah was revealed at that moment? Yeah, the entire surah was revealed in one shot. The entire surah from Inna Fatahna all the way till the end. And you know how the surah began? Inna Fatahna laka Fatha Mubina. We gave you, Ya Rasulullah, a clear victory. Oh my God. You know, and anybody can think it's victory. Is there any clause, anything that happened that shows that it's, it, was, it was a victory, right? And so the Prophet calls Umar. Says, Umar, come here. And the Prophet sits down, stops there, he sits down and he recites the entire surah to Umar, okay? After reciting the entire surah, 29 ayats, Umar goes, he turns to Rasulullah Sassam and says, Afatunhua, that was victory. He's still stuck in ayah number one. The entire surah is revealed, and he, he listened to the entire surah. Afatunhua, is that a victory? You know what the big lesson here is? Quran changes everything. Quran changes everything. You could be in the saddest, you could be the angriest, you could be the, you know, the most depressed person. You could be, you know, any emotion you could possibly imagine. The Sahabas went through a roller of emotions. 
But as soon as the Quran came, what happened? Everything changed. Everything changed. Right? Now, how is that a victory? Here, Allah subhanahu wa defines us what victory is. A lot of us think, oh, this is victory. What does it mean to be a successful person? Inshallah, in these, in these few days that we have together, I want to tell you guys, what is the Quranic thought of victory? How is victory? What is victory? How does the Quran define victory? And we would think, you know, like, what is victory? And we, we don't see any victory. The Sahabas themselves could not see victory. The Prophet says that was clear victory. How? Inshallah, in a few minutes, I'm quickly going to go over this, inshallah, to show what the clear victory is. Okay? Number one. Okay, number one, the Quraysh lost respect in the eyes of the people. Okay, from Ahzab actually, fine. I'm just gonna backtrack a little bit again. Okay, Ahzab, remember, they got a lot of funding from the people. And when people fund and you get that funding and you promise the people, look, I'm gonna give this back to you. We're gonna win, we're gonna conquer Medina, we're gonna get resources and give it back to you. The Quraysh lost that respect, right? They lost their respect in the eyes of the people. Then during the negotiations, if you guys were there, during the negotiations, what happens? The allies slowly left the Quraysh. They said, we're not. Banu Kinana, right? Banu, uh, Banu Thaqif, right? Banu Khuzar. They all said, we're not going to agree with you. And now, what else? Number three, the third thing that, show, uh, that shows the Muslims victorious is that not letting the Muslims do Umrah shows that the Quraysh don't care about pilgrims. Okay? Another thing. Number four is they sent a Quraysh leader to discuss with the Muslims. And what did the people see this as? Oh my God, Muslims are actually powerful. The Quraysh have to send a leader to negotiate. So Muslims are a muscle, you know, they are a strong party now. So people actually start having some fear for the Muslims. And writing a paper shows what? Quraysh is scared. Writing, writing pen to, putting a pen to paper shows the Quraysh is scared. You know, it's like, you know, if you imagine Last year, these Quraysh came to attack the Muslims and now Muslims walk right to their house and they say, hey, hey don't, please don't come to our house. We'll talk in our front, front, you know, front yard. Now, Lon will sit down and we'll talk. We'll have some negotiation. The Quraysh are negotiating with the Muslims. That means Quraysh, Muslims are a big deal. You know what happens after this? Uh, Muslims go and they sign treaties with other people. And they say, hey, you want to sign a treaty with us? And all of these allies are like, oh, if the Quraysh signed the paper, you guys must be strong. Yeah, we can mess with you guys. So they also all start signing treaties and they slowly, you know, started leaving the Quraysh. Okay, so if you imagine, okay, imagine like this was this was the Quraysh, okay, and Muslims with this much, Medina. And slowly the map just grew and they all became allies and Muslims. The Quraysh was just limited to themselves. And now you can say this in the, from the political sense, this was a victory, right? The Muslims had a victory over this. You know what the next thing is? What uh, uh, Subhan raise the screen? The next thing is that this treaty of Hudaybiyah directly led to the conquest of Mecca. Okay, conquest of Mecca. I'll just give you a brief uh, thing over here. You know the treaty they made. There were allies and all that. The, some idiot from the Quraysh, someone he has no idea. He goes and he fights with the Muslims. Remember, there was no, there was not supposed to be any fight for ten years. He fights with the Muslims. And what happened, the treaty was completely broken. Abu Sufyan, all the way from Mecca, comes to negotiate, begs Rasulullah to continue. Rasulullah says no. And Muslims, in just two years, they had so many people, right? They had so many allies, right? And uh, even he starts sending letters to different different countries, right? Different uh, cities during this time. And a lot of people starts to accept Islam. In just two years, Muslims were 10,000, and they come and conquer Mecca. In just two years after Hudaybiyah. Okay? And now, what is victory according to Quran? This is from the political sense. You can see, okay, this treaty led to the success, led to the conquering of Mecca in just two years. And the treaty is how Quraysh lost their respect and how Muslims gained their, you know, uh, you know, their strength, and they're able to defeat the Quraysh like that. But if you think from the Quranic perspective, these are a few points, inshallah, uh, I will be concluding very soon. These are a few points. The greatest victory, inna fatahna laka fatah mubin, Allah says, we gave you a clear victory. You know why? We know, we know, we know what, the, what the victory is? It is the loyalty of the companions to Rasulullah It is their obedience 
to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is what the Quran tells us. This is Quranic thought. Okay? Why? If you and me were there in that situation, we would have disobeyed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa We would have. Imagine, guys, if you're, if you're in, a, in a group and your brother, Abu Jandal, imagine Abu Jandal was your brother and he was tortured and he comes in and the leader says he needs to be returned. If you and me were there, we would say, screw you, right? To hell with you, whatever it is, right? To the leader, not the Prophet. To a leader and say, I don't care about you. And we would say, our minds will come in and say, no, our mind thinks that this is better. We're not going to follow revelation. They would have disobeyed the Prophet. A lot of people do that today. They say, no, what I think is correct. I don't have to follow that you know, leader of the organization or that person or that. No. Here, the companions, if you and me in that position, we would have, you know, snapped and just gone out of the way and even fought the Quraysh. We would have fought the Quraysh because of the things we were going through. But the companions, this was the best thing they could do. It is as if they did sami'na, 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 wa ata'na. You know, they did not do sami'na wa ata'na, but they did sami'na, sami'na, sami'na. We heard the Prophet says, stand up, sacrifice your animals, shave your heads. Stand up, sacrifice your animals, shave your heads. No. Stand up, sacrifice your animals, shave your heads. Fine. You see, that is a control they had in obeying Rasulullah. They could not disobey him. They could not disobey him. That is the Inna fatahna laka fatamubina. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the sahabas in the end of the surah. They are like a crop. The Sahabas is like a, is like a crop and like a, bl a blade of grass. What happens to this? Keeps moving, right? With the wind, it goes with the wind, right? It's just like emotions all over. But then it stays strong. Right? It becomes into a branch and becomes a strong tree and it becomes immovable. This is the companions. They obeyed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Their obedience to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa initially was there, but then they never let that go. They were, became an unshakable tree, right? And so Allah reveals to them, Inna fatahna laka fatah mubina. You know what fatah means, right? Inshallah, I'll just take five more minutes if we should be done. Fatah. Fatah means to remove barriers. Fatah means to remove difficulty. Fatah means to remove sadness. Okay, didn't that happen? We would think that there was a barrier. They were blocked from entering into Makkah. Allah says, we gave you a fatah. We removed the barriers. We would think there's difficulty in this, in this treaty, in these clauses. We removed the difficulty, Allah is saying. We gave you, sad. we removed sadness. Fatahna, we removed sadness. Everything is, seems contrary, contradictory to what we are thinking. Fatah also means to open, open doors for wealth. And Allah Subh'ana talks about the uh, promise of wealth in the, in the coming ayats. Right? Fatah is the start of a great victory. It's the beginning of a big victory because Allah is promising the Fatah Mecca. This is the victory. The victory is the Sahabas took the pledge the Sahabas took under the tree to obey Rasulullah. How many of us have that loyalty to Rasulullah? Today, we are 2 billion people on the face of this, not 1400, 2 billion. If 1400 people could shake the strongest powers of time, and in just in few, you know, few minutes through the negotiators, right, through that treaty, if they can destroy the enemies, what about you and me? Why don't we do the same? Because we don't have that commitment and loyalty to the cause of Allah, to the cause of Rasulullah that, that, you know, in unquestionable obedience, unquestionable obedience, even your brain, to the point that Umar is saying, aren't you the messenger of Allah? You promised I will go for Umrah and Hajj. Wait, you know what, what's happening? Even he is questioning. But then what happened? The loyalty is important. They never disobeyed him. They took some time to sacrifice, but they did at the end. Allah says, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. And then, ma taqaddama min dhambik wa ma ta'akhar. So that Allah may forgive your dhamb, your future dhamb and your previous, your, your, your previous dhamb. Them is not a sin. You know what them is? I'll give you an example. Imagine there is a man who is, um, you know, he's, he goes to masjid 30 minutes before Fajr. 
and he performs, you know, his sunan, he does some dhikr, and then he prays fajr. Okay, and there's another guy who never prays fajr. Okay, there's two people. One day, this man who always goes early, he is a little bit late and he just comes right on time. Okay, and the other guy who never prays, he's like, you know, he gets up that day and he comes and prays. And when they are standing in prayer, are they both having the same feeling? Are they both feeling the same? No. The one who used to come 30 minutes before, his level is very high. He's like, oh my God, Ya Allah, please forgive me. I didn't come early. You know, he's feeling bad about this. The other guy is like, man, today I'm going to Jannah for sure. Alhamdulillah, I made it to Fajr today. You know, look at me, right? So when a person has high personal standards and he falls short of that personal standards, that is them. It's not a sin, it's them. The Prophet ﷺ never commits sins, it's them. So the Prophet ﷺ is thinking, maybe this, this step I took, okay? Maybe the treaties are negotiated. Maybe the things that, maybe, you know, I, I fall short of Allah's standards. Maybe, you know, I didn't do what Allah wanted me to do. I didn't, I think I, I have paid something wrong. I should have done better. Allah says, Ya Rasulullah, we gave you victory and you should not be worried about the them about the things, the things, the personal feelings that you may have, we have forgiven all of that. We have taken care of that. Allah is saying, don't worry, Ya Rasulullah. And then Allah says, Allah is going to fulfill the favor, complete the favor upon you. What is a yutimmu ni'ma? This is hinting to hajj. Allah is going to let you conquer, the, conquer Mecca and you are going to perform hajj. Hajj, right? Yutimmu, and this, you know, this word was used in Surah Al-Baqarah. Wa atimmu al-hajj wa al-umrat lillah, right? And you know what's beautiful? When the Prophet moved to Medina, as soon as he moved to Medina, Surah Al-Baqarah came. The Baqarah talks about Hajj, right? The Prophet Allah already gave a hint to the Rasulullah that you are going to be performing Hajj very soon. Hudaybiyah is going to happen soon. I right? know what's beautiful. Allah says in that ayah, Wa atimmu al-hajj wa al-umrat lillah, fa in uhsirtum. Right? Perform Umrah and Hajj for the sake of Allah. But if you are stopped, if you're not able to go and perform Hajj and Umrah, then sacrifice whatever animals you have brought. Isn't that a hinting to Hudaybiyah? They went for Umrah or Hajj and they could not and they had to sacrifice the animals, right? So Allah is saying that, no, we are going to وَتِمُّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ And then وَيَهْدِيَكَ صِرَاتُ مُسْتَقِيمًا And we are going to guide you to the straight path. And this is a path straight to Jannah. Right, the path to the conquest of Mecca. You know, you went through from negotiations from the left, right, up and down, all kinds of emotions. You know, you went through a lot of difficulty. That valley that they cross with a lot of bloodshed, all of our Hajj strips and Umrah, we, we owe to them. It is because of their sacrifice, it is because of their obedience to Rasulullah at that time that you and me are able to perform Hajj today. If they did not, if they were not patient, if they did not follow Rasulullah who knows Kaaba would not have been liberated by now. It's because of their sacrifice, right? This is the Sahaba. This is the best nation, inshallah, we'll be talking about in the rest of the surah. What time is it right now in Canada, Mr. Saga? Um, you're talking to us. Um, it's 3.40 right now, 3.40 p.m. Yeah. So we'll, we'll stop right there, inshallah. We have some announcements crossing us. Okay. Okay, inshallah. So we'll conclude there. So some takeaways from today's lesson before I let Qasim do the announcement, inshallah. Some takeaways from today's uh, lesson. Number one, Quran changes everything. No matter what situation you are in, right, in what emotional state you're in, the Quran will calm you down and show you the beauty and, and you know, really give us, put a smile in times of difficulty. So connect our hearts with the Quran. Number two is uh, uh, the unquestionable loyalty that we should have for Rasulullah even if our minds don't make Right, and what we see here is that obedience to Allah subhanahu wa leads to victory, right? In a way that we can't even imagine, right? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa to give us a tawfiq to uh, implement on this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, everyone. 
Um, first of all, alhamdulillah, we're really, really blessed and uh, we're really honored to be able to ha have this beneficial gathering during lockdown and during especially our winter break. Uh, so first of all, Jazakallah Khairan to Rajanit for leading this and for making sure that we all also benefit with him along this journey of Surah Fath. Um, the first thing we want to uh, announce to everyone is that if possible, uh, that families who are attending this uh, gathering, if they all can come through one device to ensure that everyone can be accommodated since there is a limit to how many people can join the Zoom link. So we request everyone who's in the same household to join through one device for this halaqa. And obviously with, with gatherings, there's more barakah and the blessings of Allah and the angels envelop you. So it's even better for you if you're sitting in one gathering. Um, secondly, uh, there will be a sisters, girls only halaqa happening on Wednesday, inshallah, from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. Um, the link will be shared with you guys. And that halaqa is mainly on Surah Balad and how you can benefit as a believer during times of lockdown and during times of turmoil, inshallah. Uh, so we encourage all girls and sisters to attend that as well. And the link has been shared for, for everyone. Okay. Okay, alhamdulillah. So jazakallah khair. Uh, tomorrow, inshallah, we'll try to keep it within the time. Today was the most important day uh, for the story. If you, if you came in late, uh, please listen to the recordings. We'll upload it on YouTube as well on uh, the al Manat Academy website, inshallah. So you can uh, check that out. Okay. So with that, we'll conclude. Uh, اللهم بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستقنك وتب إليك سي يو جاز تمارو إن شاء الله 2.30 السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته